Hello, my name is Emily Robbins Sharp, and I'm the author of Mosaic Fictions, Writing Identity in the Spanish Civil War, which was recently published by the University of Toronto Press. Mosaic Fictions is a book of literary criticism of Canadian literature about the Spanish Civil War. The Spanish Civil War of 1936 to 1939 was a civil war in name only, as supporters of the newly democratic country fought back against an attempted international fascist coup. In my book, I focus on how Jewish Canadian writers represented the war and bring their writings into conversation with overlapping North American networks of Jewish, Black, immigrant, female, and queer writers. All of these authors were concerned with the transnational repercussions of the Spanish Civil War, but they were also aware of its local, even personal, impact. For many of these writers, the stakes of Canadian legal and social inclusion in the 1930s and 40s were particularly high because of the rise of fascism in Europe and North America. I argue that literature about the Spanish Civil War is also often about national identity. Many of the writers who depict Canadian participation in another country's war as being something that was inherently patriotic were themselves from communities that were marginalized within Canada and North America. Mosaic Fictions begins with literature composed in the war's midst and concludes with contemporary fiction and poetry to demonstrate the ongoing reverberations of the Spanish cause in Canada. 1931 was a vitally important year in Spain and Canada. Canada gained near-complete legal independence with the ratification of the Statute of Westminster, and Spain abandoned monarchy for democracy. In the new Spanish Republic, the nobility, clergy, and military lost their political power. Spanish citizens gained new rights, including voting and access to education. Meanwhile, Canada was a country in turmoil. The Great Depression saw rampant poverty and unemployment, harsh restrictions on immigration, mistreatment of indigenous populations, rising anti-Semitism, and nationwide debates over who in the Dominion counted as authentic Canadians. While Spain established itself as a new democracy, Francisco Franco began harnessing anti-democratic sentiment to plan a coup from his station within colonial Morocco. Supported by fascist Italy and Nazi Germany, as well as by Moroccan colonial soldiers who he deceived into supporting him with promises of decolonization, Franco's fascists staged a coup that erupted into a war in 1936. Most other countries pledged non-intervention. The Spanish Republic's only sources of limited support came from the governments of Mexico and the Soviet Union, as well as from approximately 35,000 international volunteers who journeyed to Spain to support the Republican loyalists by serving as soldiers, medics, ambulance drivers, and social workers. Famously, Hemingway and Orwell went to Spain. So too did nearly 1,700 Canadians. Like most of the volunteers, they traveled to Spain illegally. In addition to the 1,700 volunteers who went to Spain, Canadians back home raised funds and awareness for the Spanish cause, and artists and writers depicted the Spanish Civil War on a scale rarely seen. It's one of the most extensively documented events in Canadian history, and particularly by Canadian Jewish writers. Canadian support was especially galvanized when Franco's fascists murdered Federico García Lorca, an internationally acclaimed writer and a non-combatant. Meanwhile, the international volunteers and the Spanish Republic were no match for the power of the Spanish and Italian fascists and the German Nazis. What's more, Hitler used Spain to practice techniques of chemical warfare and mass killing, as depicted in Picasso's painting Guernica. The Spanish Republic fell in 1939, and Franco ascended to power. Thousands of international volunteers were sent to displaced persons camps in France. The Second World War began soon after. In the war and the Holocaust, the Nazis employed the techniques of warfare and mass killing they had first practiced in Spain. Despite the Spanish Civil War's tragic conclusion, it remains a vital touchstone of hope and anti-fascist solidarity for writers in Canada and internationally. In my book, I discuss how Canadian writers often write about Spain as a way of thinking through what it means to be Canadian, frequently with explicit discussions of how immigration status, gender, sexuality, race, and religion shape Canadian multicultural patriotism.
These are discussions that we continue to have today, and I trace their roots all the way back to literature of the 1930s about another country's civil war. In the 1930s, Canada was popularly represented as a former colony split between British Protestantism and French Catholicism, but with little identity of its own, and without much room for Indigenous people or other national or religious groups in this vision. The literature I discuss challenges that. Canadian literature about Spain praises both transnational solidarity and Canadian patriotism. In fact, I think that this literature defines transnational solidarity as inherent to Canadian patriotism, a cosmopolitan patriotism. The chapters of Mosaic Fictions are organized thematically around the shared values which I trace across literary texts. This is my way of trying to highlight the multiple, often unexpected intersections between different filiations and affiliations within global leftist participation. Chapter one is called Love, Impossible War Romances. The chapter examines how race, religion, and gender influence the construction of the patriotic citizen within this very traditional kind of war literature. I compare novels by writers such as Ted Allen, Charles Yell Harrison, Mordecai Richler, Ernest Hemingway, and Upton Sinclair to examine how Jewish Canadian writers subvert the norms of the war romance genre. For example, Richler's novel Joshua Then and Now satirizes Hemingway's version of wartime masculinity in For Whom the Bell Tolls. Richler writes of Joshua, he never necked with a girl without wondering, if never daring to ask, O oh, Riva Mandelbaum, O oh, Hannah Steinberg, but did thee feel the earth move? For Richler's characters, the combination of nostalgia for the Spanish cause and a longing for mainstream Gentile acceptance becomes their poignant, problematic way of viewing romance. The second chapter is called Sympathy, Cosmopolitan Combat and Postcolonial Spain. It takes on the question of war making, asking how international volunteers justified their participation in a war fought on behalf of a colonial power. African and Jewish diasporic writers, including Langston Hughes, Mordecai Richler, and John A. Williams, represent African and African-American participation in the Spanish conflict. For instance, Hughes's epistolary poem, Letter from Spain, describes an encounter between an African-American International Brigade's volunteer and a Moroccan mercenary soldier while Williams's novel, Captain Blackman, charts a history and a future of African-American military service, with the Spanish Civil War a key conflict within this trajectory. These writers connect Spain and Britain's enduring colonial legacies, insisting on the intersections of race, ethnicity, religion, and nationality in the transnational fight against fascism. Chapter 3 is entitled Community, Documenting Female Friendship in Spain, and it approaches questions of race, religion, gender, and belonging in another way, by demonstrating how North American women writers re-envisioned female contributions to wartime. This chapter, in particular, relies on archival research because many women writers, and particularly Black women writers, have often been shut out of publishing. In the case of Solaria Key's memoirs, for instance, I discuss how her efforts to tell her singular story as the only African-American nurse to volunteer in Spain were actively suppressed. The chapter looks to other unpublished, out-of-print, and published works by writers including Miriam Waddington, Martha Gellhorn, Dorothy Livesay, and Muriel Ruckheiser to demonstrate their common project of showcasing the women-led communities that sprang up across Spain. The fourth chapter is called Inclusion, Elegizing Lorca, and it charts the 80-plus years of sustained Canadian responses to the murder of queer Spanish poet and playwright Federico García Lorca. The outpouring of elegies to Lorca by writers from around the world is a testament to his literary influence and his enduring power as a symbol of sexual and artistic freedom. I look to nearly 20 Canadian responses, from Dorothy Livesay's early elegy to Leonard Cohen's translation of Lorca's poem, Take This Waltz, to Brian Dedora's book-length poetic engagement with Lorca and Place, Lorcation. Finally, the book's conclusion, Remembrance, Envisioning Spain and Canada Now, looks to 21st century Canadian fiction about the Spanish Civil War. Stephen Collis's novel, The Red Album, indicts a history of Spanish colonialism and homophobia.
June Hutton's novel Underground highlights Canadian systemic racism towards Indigenous peoples. Terence Rundle West's Not in My Father's Footsteps centers the experiences of Jewish and Quebecois characters. These and many other works of fiction examine experiences of marginalization within the Spanish conflict and further connect the Spanish Civil War to ongoing and emergent local and global crises. This brings me to my book's title, Mosaic Fictions. The widespread use of the term mosaic to describe Canadian multiculturalism originates in the same decade as the Spanish Civil War. It was popularized in John Murray Gibbon's 1938 book, Canadian Mosaic. Gibbon's book includes chapters on different national groups that have immigrated to Canada, along with a single chapter on so-called Hebrews. The metaphor of a Canada composed of peacefully coexisting, distinct yet connected cultures that fit together like decorative tiles would prove integral to how many marginalized Canadian writers would envision Canada via Spain. Mosaic is also an archaic term for Jewish. So, while John Murray Gibbon invokes a now outmoded metaphor for Canadian society, my own book's title makes use of the term mosaic to challenge this idea of Canadian multiculturalism composed of discrete communities and to invoke the mosaic, that is Jewish, writers who promulgated this metaphor as they strove to write their communities into that very society. Actual mosaics are a frequent decoration in Spain too a reminder of the country's Muslim heritage before the violence of the Spanish Inquisition sought to rid the country of Jewish and Muslim Spaniards. Spain has its own mosaics and its own mosaic fiction as well, in the form of a long-standing refusal to acknowledge its Jewish or Muslim heritage. In thinking about the multiple resonances of the term mosaic, then, I want to suggest that Canadian Spanish Civil War literature helps us to think through how patriotism and internationalism inform each other, and how Canadian identity is affected by different histories of power, immigration, conflict, and marginalization. I'd love to hear what you think of my book. Thank you for watching.